are uh, actually finishing off our series in the book of Haggai this evening. So if you do have a Bible with you, please turn to Haggai uh, chapter 2. And we're going to read together from verse 10. So Haggai chapter 2 and verse 10. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 10. If you're struggling, if you uh, go to the start of the New Testament and just work back a few pages. Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priests concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? Then the priests answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priests answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And now carefully consider this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs, and there was but ten, when one came to a wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail, in all the labours of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will make you Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. And may God bless what we've just read together from his word. And may he be uh, pleased to speak to us through it this evening. Do God's plans ever change? Or do we perhaps sometimes lack faith in God's plans and God's purposes? Maybe things go wrong in your life. Maybe things go wrong with your family. Maybe things go wrong in our church or, or in our community. And so, so we wonder, well, isn't God supposed to be with me? Isn't he supposed to be in charge? Isn't he supposed to be good? Hasn't he promised that all things will work together for my good? Why is this happening? Maybe COVID has you wondering, is God really in control? Uh, this last message in Haggai is actually all about God's plans, all about how God's plans are unchanging, how they are completely trustworthy, and how no matter what it seemed to these people in the days of Haggai in 520 BC, everything is on track and everything is going just as God wants it to go. That's the basic message of these closing uh, verses of Haggai chapter 2. Think about the situation these people are in. These are people who were living with a messianic hope. They were expecting God to keep 
his ancient promise to send them a saviour. But what is their recent history? How does it appear to them that God is measuring up to his word? It's been so long since these promises were made. They're now a crushed nation, enslaved to foreign powers. Yes, this new temple is being built, but it doesn't compare to the old one. It's not built as well. It's not uh, got the glory of that previous temple. In fact, all of the glory days of the nation of Israel are gone. Surely if there was ever a time God was going to bring the Messiah and establish the, the nation of Israel in the way they were all looking forward to and they were all expecting, it would have been in the days of David or the days of Solomon, not in these days of decline, not in these days of, of need, not in these days when they're just pawns in the hands of big and powerful nations. Is God really going to keep his word? Is the Messiah really going to come? In the midst of those kinds of doubts and fears comes this closing message, this fourth message from God that Haggai has to deliver to, his, to the people of God. And it is a message that we see is directed uh, towards Zerubbabel, but it is actually for all of the people to hear because it's a message of reassurance to them. It's a message that, that God's plans are still on track. And that's what I want us to see tonight as we look at God's chosen builder. And we're focusing on Haggai chapter 2 and verses 20 to 23. Uh, and I'll read them again. And as I read them again, as we look at God's chosen builder, I want you just to notice two things. I want you to notice that it does tell us directly that Zerubbabel is chosen by God. And I also want you to notice how often we hear God saying, I will. I will. Keep your eyes and ears open for these two things. So reading from verse 20. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel is chosen, and I didn't actually count how many I wills there were there, but it kept coming, didn't it? God saying, I will, I will, I will. This is what I'm going to do. But God says, Zerubbabel, I've chosen you, and I am going to do all of these things. Two points. Zerubbabel is ch God's chosen builder, and God is in control. So let's begin to unpack this a little bit more. My first point, God is on the throne. God is on the throne. Just look at what God says. Verse two, I will shake heaven and earth. I will shake heaven and earth. God is in control of creation. Heaven and earth answers to his will and to his voice. If he wants to do something that shakes the whole of created order, he can. And he can do it just by the power of his voice. And this is what he says. I will shake heaven and earth. God is on the throne of creation. Look at verse 22. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. God rules the nations. He raises them up, and as we read here, he brings them down when he wants to. He is in control. He rules them. And armies, well, they mean nothing to him. The horses and their riders shall come down. They don't mean anything to him. They don't scare him. In our dog-eat-dog -dog world, where, where even brothers turn against each other, 
and kill each other to get to their own ends. Well, God is even in control of that sort of sin. God is on the throne. He rules over creation. He rules over nations. And he rules in the lives of individuals as well. Verse 23. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. He rules in the lives of the individual as well. God rules. He rules in the big things and he rules in the small things. Our plans can be shaken. Our plans can be undone by changing circumstances that we have no control over. Uh, it can be as simple, can't it, as our plans might be undone by the fact that there's no petrol in the petrol station. Absolutely nothing we can do about that. But it could undo some of our plans. But God's plans are not subject to change. And they're not subject to change because he is in control of every single circumstance. He has it all planned out and he is completely and totally sovereign. He is in control. God is on the throne. And that means that we don't judge his ability to keep his promises based on what little of his plan you can see and you can perceive going on around you at this very moment. We have very limited view. We can only see so much. God sees and knows it all. He has the big picture. And he has the power to make sure his plans happen. This is the reassurance that he's bringing his people here. I am God. I am in control. This is what I will do. My plan is still on track. I will make it happen. The Messiah is coming. Secondly, why choose Zerubbabel? Why choose Zerubbabel? That's what we're told God has done, isn't it? In verse 23, uh, God says, For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Why choose Zerubbabel? Well, it's not because he's earned this honour. It's not because he's worthy of this choice. No, actually, actually, just four months ago, he was looking after himself. He had no interest in building God's temple four months ago. He was looking after his own interests. He was making sure his own house was well decorated and had the best wood panelling available, whilst God's house laid in ruins. That's Zerubbabel. That's the man he is. He's a failure as a leader of God's people. A complete and utter failure. He's not worthy Yet God says to him, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheatiel, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Why choose Zerubbabel? Why choose Zerubbabel? Well, quite simply, because that's what God does. This is what God does. He chooses people. He chooses broken sinners. And he raises them up, gives them things to do in his service, equips them for that service and uses them to his honour and to his glory. This is what God does. He chose Noah to show grace to and he saved Noah and his family through the flood. He chose Abraham and called him out of his homeland. He chose Isaac over Ishmael. He chose Jacob over Esau. He chose Moses and Aaron he chose David. And of course, when the Lord Jesus Christ walked upon the earth, he did exactly the same, didn't he? He chose those 12 apostles to follow him. God chooses people. And not one of these people were outstanding human beings. They were sinners, just like you and just like me. God chooses people. God raises people up. God equips people for the task that he has given them to do. And I find that a tremendous comfort and help personally. I'm not here uh, teaching you from God's word tonight because I'm a great or a special man in any way at all. 
I'm not. I'm like Zerubbabel. Left to my own devices, I'm a complete and utter failure. I'm a sinner worthy only of God's judgment. But this is God's choice. This is what God has chosen. But even more fundamental than this is, is how this relates to salvation. I trust uh, that we all accept the Bible's teaching of election. I trust that I don't have to uh, defend that in this forum, that you are chosen in the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Trust I don't have to defend that. I trust we all accept that as being, yes, that's what the Bible teaches. We don't struggle with that. But here's the point I do want to make. Because what we know in our heads and what we actually feel in our hearts isn't always in sync. It doesn't always agree and in our hearts, there is a sense of pride. In our hearts, there is a sense of self-reliance. So we like to actually, in, in our hearts, believe that, that there was a reason. That there is something in me, which is why God chose me. We like to perhaps think, well, well I was more willing. Or I'm a better person. I'm more open-minded. I was more willing to listen when the gospel was preached. Or I've got this gift or that talent, which God obviously saw he could use, so he chose me for it. In whatever way your heart is trying to deceive you, and it is trying to deceive you, you need to remember this. The reason God chose you is because that is God's purpose. He is glorifying himself and himself alone through your salvation, as Romans 9 verse 23 makes clear. You're not chosen because of any worthiness or deserving that you yourself have. God has chosen you despite your complete unworthiness. If and I know it's a little bit strange to put it in these terms. But if you can imagine yourself standing at the gates of heaven and being asked, well, why do you think you deserve to come into heaven? And your answer begins, because I, you've got it entirely wrong. The reason you have a place in heaven is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that man on that middle cross has invited you to be with him in paradise like he invited that dying thief. That's your reason. So God's choice. God chose Zerubbabel. God chooses us and he chooses us to bring glory to himself not so we can sit here and say oh i deserve it i've done this i've done that it's all of the lord jesus christ well finally tonight what was god's purpose with zerubbabel what was God's purpose with Zerubbabel? He's chosen Zerubbabel. What has he chosen Zerubbabel for? What is God's purpose with Zerubbabel? Well, God says that in the midst of all this world-changing action that he promises to perform, he is going to make Zerubbabel like his signet ring. I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheotiel, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. A signet ring. We heard a little bit about one on Sunday evening. It's something that, that carries a ruler's authority. It's like a stamp and it would be used to imprint the seal of that king on, on a document. And it would make that document official. 
It will give that document the king's authority. So that if you had a document with the king's seal on it, and you were reading that document, it would be as if the king was stood there speaking directly to you. That's what the seal means. It means this comes with the authority of the king. So when God is saying to Zerubbabel, I will make you like a signet ring. He is saying, I will make your words like the words of God. That's what God promises to make Zerubbabel. And yet it gives us a little bit of a problem because history doesn't record Zerubbabel doing anything like that. We learn from Zechariah 4 verse 9 that in 516 BC, he's there for the official dedication of the new temple when it opens. But after that, he kind of fades from the scene. And we don't really hear anything else about him. Nothing special seems to happen in his lifetime uh, that would make him stand out in this unique way that God has described him as here. But maybe, maybe you've already got the clue in just how great this promise is to what God is actually saying through Haggai to Zerubbabel. Because could any mere man live up to that prophecy? Could any mere man have that kind of authority that when they speak, their words are the words of God? Could any man live up to this, that you will have the power and authority of God at your beck and call to use as you will? Now, Zerubbabel, with all the authority that he did have as the ruler of God's people, is a type. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose earthly lines Zerubbabel actually does stand, uh, Matthew 1, 12 to 13, or Luke 3, 7. Uh, he's in both those, that, both those genealogies. The point is, going right back to what I was saying at the beginning, that the people would look at Zerubbabel. They would see that God was preserving the line of David, the line through which the Messiah was going to come. And they would continue to look forward to God keeping this promise. Just like they would have, in the days of David, been looking at him as a, as a continuation of God keeping his promise. That one day, one will stand upon this earth and the words that he spoke would be the words of God. Spoken with God's authority. Zerubbabel was the sign and the picture to these people that God's purposes had not changed. That his plans were not falling off the rails. But that everything was actually proceeding forward just as God had always planned it to. So, just for a few minutes briefly this evening in closing, I want us just to think about, from what we've looked at this evening, what we see about the Lord Jesus Christ in this prophecy. And we must see him as, as the fulfilment of the promise. We must see him as the fulfilment of the promise. From the beginning of time, since that moment mankind fell into sin, God has been repeating and enlarging upon this promise that one day a man born of a woman will come into this world and will undo everything that Satan thinks he has achieved. And of course, in Galatians 4 verse 4, we read, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise. This promise that we see given again here at the end of Haggai. The Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the promise. And we must understand the significance of his coming. We must understand the significance of his coming. Of course, his coming has a personal significance for you and for me. He came to save us. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And as he hung upon that cross, he knew he was paying for your sin and for my sin. But 
Go back to all those I wills of God. Notice how he intends to shake creation. Notice how he intends to bring the nations down and understand the massive significance of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. His coming into this world changes everything. It is the fulcrum on which history rotates. He came to defeat sin. He came to open the way for you and me into the presence of God. He came to crush the head of Satan, to reverse everything that Satan believed he had achieved as he led Adam and Eve into eating that fruit. He came to save and to deliver and to put right everything that was broken. He came to shake the earth and the heavens. He came to bring down nations. He came to save and to deliver. So he's the fulfilment of the promise. We should see the significance of his coming. And in closing, think about the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what this is all about, isn't it? And I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. The Lord Jesus Christ is that signet ring of God. He has the authority of God. It's what he says, isn't it, in the Great Commission, before he commands us to go out and make disciples. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, verse 18. What about the people who heard him? What about the people who actually heard the Lord Jesus Christ teach and saw the miracles that he did? What was their testimony about him? Well, in Mark 1, verse 22, we read this. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Uh, same chapter, verse 27. Then they were all amazed and they questioned amongst themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Lord Jesus Christ has the authority of God. He has the authority to save you. He has the authority to declare you clean of your sin. He has the authority to open heaven's gates for you so that you can go in. He has the authority. And that's where I want to leave this series in Haggai, with this knowledge that, that today, you and I, we're God's chosen builders. We're chosen by him to build for his glory in the town of Ramsey. He's chosen us. We may feel inadequate for the task because actually on our own, we are. But he's chosen us and he has all authority and all power. Our task is to get on serving him, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ has promised to be with us in that authority and that power. And next time, I hope to begin a, a series on what we need to be building together. We're going to look at uh, a series that I'm calling Rediscovering Church, in which we'll be looking at what we need to be building together. Well, may God bless what we thought of this evening. Uh, amen.